everybody, and welcome to our fourth lesson on every day in the spirit. Today we are going to be talking about kindness and goodness. We're pairing them together because we don't have enough weeks to do all nine fruits of the spirit. So, woo. And they're also very similar, the two yeah. Greek words, by the way. So, yeah. So let's start with prayer. Lord, thanks for letting us uh, be here together again, Father. I pray you're blessing uh, the people in our groups and that you'll just help them today to uh, open their hearts up to you. Lord, help us to understand what kindness and goodness really is. And help us, then, Lord, to allow you to build those qualities in our lives. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to start off with kindness first because it's the first one in the succession. But uh, kindness is treating others and myself the way Jesus would. Um, this is, you know, do you remember the what would Jesus do <laughs> bracelets? Uh, those, yeah. They're kind of silly now. And we kind of, I think, sometimes make fun of them because they're a little bit cliche. But... If I can remember and, and, and think of the way that Jesus treated and interacted with people, um, it does help me sometimes to, to decide whether this is a good or kind act, you know? Um, the word actually describes, and this is a quote, the sympathetic uh, kindliness or sweetness of temper, which puts others at their ease and shrinks from giving pain. I love that de definition of kindness, that it's... that. It shrinks from giving pain. You yeah. know, it's it's that it's wanting to do to others as you would want them to do to, to you. you. Right. You know, and it's important to know that, that Jesus is the 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 model that we look to for what kindness really is. Right. Um, which, which helps you understand that kindness isn't weakness. I, I mm -hmm. think a lot of people equate those two, or or sort of equate them. And again, you read the Gospels. Jesus is many things. He's not weak. Mm -hmm. But he was kind. Absolutely. So you can be strong and kind at the same time. Absolutely. Um, look at Ephesians 4.32. It says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. I like that it puts forgiveness in there because yes. that is a kindness. Um, you know, and, and tender-hearted. I think that's another thing, too, being being. Uh, soft-hearted enough to to understand how your actions are going to affect someone right you know? yeah and jesus role uh, models that he's our role model he shows us exactly how you do that in his ministry he's strong but he's kind he's forgiving and of course ultimately he gives his life uh and he actually ends up being for at least a moment split from the holy spirit and the father mm -hmm. just so that we can be forgiven don't get any more kind mm -hmm. than that now, actually, the kindness of God is probably one of my favorite attributes of him because, I mean, we already know that, you know, he's forgiving and he's He's patient with us, but I think, like, God is so kind to us. There's things that he does for us that that, that are extravagant, that are not even needed, and I, I, it's one of my favorite parts about him because I feel like he, he would be amazing even if he wasn't, you know, kind, but he goes out of his way, I think to find ways to be kind to his kids, and, and I love that. Um, kindness flows from Jesus and leads me closer to him. You know, um, it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Right. And so it's his kindness in our life that really turns us around. Look at uh, Titus 3, 4 through 7. It says, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life, that he poured out on us richly. To me, yeah. that is such a picture of the kindness of God. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like that he says goodness and loving kindness. Notice goodness and kindness are, are together there, which is one of the reasons we're combining them in this lesson because they go together and they, they're always together, really, when you think about it. And yeah, so our salvation is an act of kindness from God. Mm -hmm. We didn't deserve it, didn't earn it, and if he hadn't done it, we would really have no grounds to complain. But he gives us this salvation just because he loves us and he is a kind God. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that. So I'm being, I am called in by God to be kind like Jesus was, whether it's appreciated and returned or not. And I think that's, that, now we go back to what we talked about last week about uh, being patient because uh, people are not always going to return. 
your kindness. People say, oh, if you just, if what you put out to the universe is what you get back. No, it's not. Mm. You can be loving and kind and get all kinds of bad stuff back. And you all know that. And again, Jesus is the perfect role model for that. It's true. The only perfect man that ever lived. And what did we do with him? We killed him. And not with kindness. No. <laughs> no. So understand that, 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 that a true uh, kind heart is kind, whether that's returned or not. Mm -hmm. um, look what it says in Luke 6, 35. Uh, Jesus said this, Love your enemies, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. That one's really hard. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Even the evil. Think of the evil people in the world today, and yet the sun rises and sets for them. It rains. It, all these things happen, and that's an expression of God's kindness. So even though people might not return my kindness, if the only reason you do nice things for other people is to get nice stuff back, then you're missing the point of kindness. Mm -hmm. Kindness is, like he says, lend and don't expect it back. Mm -hmm. Give acts of kindness to people and if they return them well that's great that's wonderful to accept them and be appreciative if they don't thank god that he gave you the opportunity to be like christ and be kind to mm -hmm. them yeah we're kind not because people are deserving of kindness but because we desire to be like christ right and he's kind no matter what that's just who is his nature and who he is he can't yeah. not be kind right which brings us now to the other side of that coin the next bullet point kindness isn't always nice and this is a, a place where I personally have a, a real, uh, I have a problem with this. Because in my head, I don't know where I got this, if it's the way I was raised or just the way I'm wired. But kindness and niceness kind of go together, but actually they don't. Um, Proverbs 27, 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. So we've all had people kiss up to us, you know, but that's, that's not what a real friend does. A real friend tells you the truth, even when it hurts. And probably the classic example of this, we're not going to read it, but you can look it up. It's in Matthew 16, 22, and 23, where Peter turns to Jesus after Jesus tells him, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, they're going to crucify me, they're going to kill me. And he says, no, Lord, that cannot happen to you. And Jesus looks at him and says, get behind me, Satan. That's not kind. Calling you Satan is not kind. Nice. It's not nice. It's not nice. <laughs> it's not kind. I mean, it is kind, but it's not nice. I'm right. sorry. Yeah, you're saying it right, and I'm saying it wrong. I was thinking of back in, in high school, for a while, some for some weird reason, they put some of the high school class in with an adult class, and, and this adult class was really studying some weird stuff. It wasn't really a Bible study. They were just talking about things that they thought might be true or whatever. And we kept trying to bring it back to the Bible, and at one point, one of the women in the class said to me, and said, I think, because we were talking about Satan, and she said to me, I think you might be worse than the devil, Louie. <laughs> That wasn't kind or nice. But I was kind to her in return. I just kept pointing out, look, this is what the Bible says. Let's deal with what Scripture says. So that's the whole thing is we just need to realize that sometimes the kindest thing you can do for me is to tell me something that's going to hurt my feelings. Mm -hmm. Or even do something, you know. Sometimes yeah. the kindest thing we can do for people is what's good for them, not what, what they're going to feel good about. Yeah. You know, someone... Um, you know, we don't want to enable uh, difficult behavior yes. sometimes. And, you know, I know my mom really struggled with that with my brother when yeah. he was in college and he was caught up in drugs and he'd call crying asking for money. Yeah. The kind thing to do was to tell him no. Yes. But the, that was not the nice thing. No. Nope. You know, niceness is about making the other person feel good, but that's not always kind. That's absolutely right, and I tell people that all the time. Don't enable people, whether it's a drug addiction, alcohol addiction, or some other kind of, of, of uh, addictive behavior or sinful behavior pattern. You're not helping them when you do that. I know it makes you feel good. It's what they want, so they're happy for a moment. But in reality, you're just making things worse. Mm -hmm. So kindness is having the courage to say, nope, I'm not going to do that. Okay, number two, God's kindness in Christ is also a major motivator for spiritual growth. It, uh, when you understand the kindness of God, it should make you want to be more like Him and grow closer to Him. Mm -hmm. Second Peter uh, 2, 1-3 one, one through three says, So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Mm -hmm. So, And that word is also translated kind. It's the same word that's translated kind in Galatians 5 for fruit of the Spirit. So when you see the kindness of God, it should make you want to be more like Him and motivate you 
uh, and if you're not growing spiritually, maybe you haven't truly understood or experienced the kindness that Jesus gives to us. Absolutely, and that's going back to that verse again, that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Right. You know, God doesn't have to be, uh, you know, shame us into to repenting. Actually, when we experience and get a taste of his goodness and kindness, it makes you want to be different. It yeah. makes you want to let go of things. Um, and if you think about that, it's our kindness towards other people that can also help them to see that God is kind. Right. And so that, that's um, one of the, the ways I think we can win people over who maybe um, aren't receptive to the gospel, aren't receptive yeah. to God, is when they see our loving kindness, then they begin to think, well, if, if people are like this, even when it doesn't make sense, what is the God like that they serve? Yeah, and because, I mean, that's the primary way they're going to see God's kindness is through us, at least at first. You know, especially people, uh, if they don't know anything about the Bible or anything about Jesus or whatever, how are they going to know? Well, they can look at the world around them, but they can also, they should look at us and they should see from us, believers in Jesus, they should see that kindness of God. And that hopefully will help draw them to want to know more about him. Mm -hmm. Which leads us kind of, we're going to transition into to goodness. Um, number three on your outline, I am, I'm called to prove what is good. Uh, what do we mean by that? Well, look at, look at Romans 12, 1 and 2. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. But we cannot actually discern what is good if we don't renew our minds in right. Christ. That's right. Absolutely. That, that's the key there. You have to have a renewed mind. You'll notice that that's tied to worshiping God and uh, that then I can actually test. Now, to test something means you try it, see if it works. Is this, is this really true? That's you know the scientific method. Someone comes up with a theory, which someone wants to find a theory in science as a, as a beautiful idea that's ganged up on by a brutal bunch of facts. <laughs> so I have a theory, then I try it. Maybe it doesn't work. Then I get to change my theory. Then you keep, and you go through this process scientifically. Well, the same is true with God's will. I don't always know what God's will is, so I got to try it. I got to test it. I got to see if these things are scriptural. And are they true and do they work? And then gradually God will lead me to, to, a, to a correct understanding. Mm -hmm. And I like that it says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, yeah. because the world will tell you that certain things are good that are not good. That's right. And we can't trust um, our own instincts sometimes since we're in the world. Yep. Uh, we have to look to the Lord to decide what is actually good for me, what is good in, in, uh, in this world. Um, it's not always what we think. <laughs> no, and in fact, today, the world is very specifically, our, in our culture, telling us certain things are good when the Bible says those things are mm -hmm. bad. So, again, it comes down to that choice. Am I going to choose mm -hmm. what the culture says, which will, which will make everybody around me, a lot of the people around me anyway, happy, or am I going to choose what God says is good, mm -hmm. which will make God happy, and ultimately is the truth. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes along with First Thessalonians five nineteen through 22 do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good and abstain from every form of evil. If you, if you will quench the spirit if you are confused about what is good yeah. and what is not good. So it is important that we test those. And, and, and the test for me is, uh, does it hold up with scripture? Yeah. Does, does scripture support this theory or this idea of, of this being good? If it doesn't, it doesn't matter what I feel. And it doesn't matter what I think, and it doesn't matter what the people around me are telling me. It matters only what truth is. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, as a corollary to that, number four on your outline is, I am commanded to cling to what is good. You'll notice Paul says up there, test everything, hold fast to what is good. You gotta, it's not enough to know it, then you've got to hang on to it. Because mm -hmm. if you know it and then you lose it, well, it's not doing you very much good. Uh, Romans 12, 9, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. You'll notice that in both those verses, Thessalonians and here in Romans, it, 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 it always mentions rejecting evil. Part of being good and following the goodness of God is you have to reject evil. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't say, well, I, I'm going to be good, but I'm still going to have this evil here because it's my favorite sin or whatever. <laughs> that doesn't work too well. You've got to reject it. You've got you've to kick it out of your life. And you've got to hold fast, hold on. 
and to keep, what is good. keep that in front of you because a lot of times we focus on the negative, we focus yeah. on the bad, we focus on what's not going right, right, and we miss what God is doing that is good. We miss those things, and mm-hmm. I think it's very easy to become discouraged. I think it's easy to quench the spirit, yeah. and, the, and, and we wonder sometimes why we're not producing this fruit, and it's because we're not actually focusing and hanging on to the good. That's a good point. Um, Yeah, it's easy to look at the world and bemoan how bad it is. And you can go read stuff that people wrote 100, 200, 500, 1,000 years ago, and they were saying the same thing about the day they lived in as we say about our day. So, And you can argue about which culture was best or worst or whatever, but the point is, is there's always bad stuff in human culture because there's humans there. (laughs) So, but, But there's also always good that God is doing because God is here and God is active and God is alive. So that's where our main focus needs to be, right? Mm-hmm. And then number five, I think this is the hardest part. Then I must do what is good. <laughs> yeah. It's not enough to know what is good. It's not enough to you know believe that certain things are good. I actually have to produce this in my life. I actually need to, to be someone who acts on that. Uh, look at Galatians 6.10. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. You know, I like that it's, it says, well, as you have opportunity, you know, because you have to look for those, but God yeah. will give us opportunities and we should be pursuing and looking for, where is God giving me an opportunity to do good? And it might be with people that you don't want to do good towards because yeah. they frustrate you or because, you know, they disagree with you. But actually those are the opportunities that I think are the most important because not only does it have the potential to change them, I think it has the potential to change me. It, it, it changes that, that my goodness isn't only given to those who I also deem are good. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah, and those opportunities, when they come up, you have to seize them. Uh, I told this story in a sermon a couple of weeks ago about um, the my time on the Camino this year, 2018 is when we're filming this. Um, but I was walking along one day, one morning, and there was someone by the side of the trail sitting down. There were a couple of people with her. So I stopped to see if I could help and talk to her. And then, you know, the situation was more or less in hand and I couldn't, I, I don't know any medicine, so I couldn't really help. But then I remembered what you did with the youth group, which when you take them out and you pray mm-hmm. for people. And I thought, this is an opportunity. So I said, you know, I'm a pastor. Would you mind if I prayed for you? Well, she was all excited about it. She was Catholic. And so she, I went over and she stood up, a uh, little help to get her up and, and prayed for her because her ankle was really hurting her foot. And then she asked me, well, before you go, could you pray for me? I have this unforgiveness about certain things in my life. Would you pray about that? So I did. Cool. Yeah. And that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't taken that opportunity. Mm-hmm. So when it comes up, grab it. Don't let it slide because you just never know when you're going to get another opportunity. That's true. Yeah. So number six, I should remember that goodness starts in my heart. Now, I, this is something which I, I, I talk about, I think, a lot because I, I, I believe it's important that Christianity is all about what's in your heart. It's not necessarily what outward thing that you show to the world. Um, there's a long passage here, and I'm only going to read part of it. You may be familiar with the story in Matthew 19, starting in verse 16, when the teacher comes to him, and, or a man comes to Jesus and says, Teacher, what good deed, notice he's focused on doing good, must I do to have eternal life? It's a very Jewish question. He wants to know, what do I got to do? I write it down, I'll do it, and I'm in. Take it off. The yeah, very legalistic. And he said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. And he lists a bunch of them. And then the young man says to him in verse 20, uh, all these I've kept, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And then the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Now, the thing here is, where was his heart? The problem with this man wasn't that he had a lot of stuff. The problem was that this stuff was an idol that he put before God and he couldn't let it go. He couldn't, like we said a minute ago, he could not abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. He wanted to cling to God who was good, but he also wanted to cling to his idols. And Jesus, being kind, confronts him with the fact that if you're going to be good, you can't do that. You can't have both. You've got to make a choice. Mm -hmm. And he chose poorly, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. So that's sad, but that's the choice that we all have in our hearts. Am I going to really choose God or am I going to choose something else? Right. And, and, you know, when we say that goodness starts in your heart, 
we're not the source of goodness. The spirit is, right. but it starts internally. It's an internal decision. It's right. an internal um, yielding to what the Holy Spirit's going to do. And it doesn't always feel good, <laughs> I think, to yield to the goodness of God. I think yeah. sometimes it's actually quite hard, Very uh, costly, and painful. Yeah. Um, and so it doesn't always feel good to do good. <laughs> but if we want... Um, if we want to produce that fruit, we have to remember that it's not just about what I'm doing, but it's my motives in doing it. Yep. It's it's uh, what's going on internally. And right. so you can look really squeaky clean in what you're doing and still be missing out on the fruit of the goodness of God. Right. Because the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit is what people see or I see on the outside of me. But the actual work of the Spirit is in my heart that produces that good act or that good word. Yeah. Uh, in Matthew 15, Jesus said... What comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, fault, swissness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with, un with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. And he's not saying that it's okay to be sexually immoral or whatever. He's saying that those things are the symptoms of a bad heart. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit's job is to make my heart more like Christ. Mm -hmm. And then... From out of that good heart will flow good things. Mm -hmm. That's like, you hear people say all the time, like, I, I don't even know where that came from. It right. just came out of me. I don't know where, right. I don't know why I did that. That's so right. unlike me. And it's, <laughs> it's like, actually, that, that, that's very much you because yeah. you're the source of it. That's just, sometimes we're surprised because we right. don't know how corrupt our hearts can be yeah. until... God puts pressure onto the right situation. Yeah, that's one of my one of my favorite, as in unfavorite things. People say, "Well, that wasn't me." I said, "Well, that's funny because I heard your voice and your mouth was moving, so I think it was you." The <laughs> devil didn't make you do it. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. That and, and that's that. That's what you were talking about just a second ago. That's the painful moment when I have to accept. Yeah, that is me. That mm -hmm. I have that anger, that bitterness somewhere in my heart. It doesn't mean that it that it takes over my whole life, maybe, but somewhere in there, that's there because that's what came out. Mm -hmm. And if it came out of me, that means it's in me. It's there. Yeah, absolutely. So those are a few things about uh, goodness and kindness. Hopefully that's helped you. And, uh, and we, as always, encourage you to be open in the discussion that's about to follow. Open up your heart. Be vulnerable with your small group members. And share what's really happening in your heart so that the Holy Spirit can really get mm -hmm. in there mm -hmm. and make a difference. Yeah, let's pray. God, we just uh, we want to partner with what your Holy Spirit is doing in us. And we want to give... Uh, way to what the Holy Spirit wants to do and so uh, show us those areas God where, where things are maybe in our hearts or coming out um, that, that don't belong there. I pray that you would uh, help us to be really honest with ourselves about where where we are producing the fruit of kindness and the fruit of goodness God. Um, I pray that you would show us and teach us how to to cling to those things, how to make the necessary changes God and um, how to lay things down in such a way that this becomes um, a very tangible fruit in our lives. Not something that we have to put on or pretend, but God, it's something that genuinely comes out of our hearts. And we pray that you would guide the discussion and help everyone to be courageous and vulnerable. In Jesus' name, amen.